Hey folks, I'm sure we're all familiar with the concept of a workstation graphics card. Nvidia traditionally had their Quadro range, while AMD had their Pro line of workstation cards. These cards, in terms of silicon quality, are the golden goose of chips, the best of the best. From science and research to engineering and medical fields, to your home card office, choosing a workstation card over the consumer version for maximum durability and longevity, and the ability to stand up to the rigours of daily stress use can often be very appealing. In short, you're paying a premium and you should expect to get the highest quality of components throughout. That said, the theory of what these cards should be and the reality of what they are don't always align. Like in every industry, profit comes into play. And when thinking about my own RTX A2000 GPU, this is the exact situation that we found ourselves in. Although it's a fantastic little card, compromises have been made to save costs, and in what is a fairly common theme with Nvidia's Ampere graphics cards, this rears its head in the form of the card's thermal interfaces. Now, normally on low power consumer cards, you don't need to worry about below average thermal interfaces. Take this GTX 1050 Ti for example. It had never been opened up, and two out of the four GDDR5 memory chips were simply hidden under an aluminium base plate, no thermal pads at all. I stripped it all back, repasted the card, cleaned it up, and added some thermal pads to the memory chips. And well, it made no difference whatsoever. The card is a fairly open design with two big fans and a heat pipe Finstack cooler setup, complete overkill for a 75 watt card, and through brute cooling force it mitigates any deficiencies in the thermal interface. In the RTX A2000 though, it's a different story, so let's get a quick sense check of the thermal performance, then open it up and show you what I mean. To test the card, I want to hit both the GPU and memory consistently, and as hard as possible for the memory, and mining Ethereum is a solid way to do this. For the baseline, using MSI Afterburner, I set the card up with a 90% power limit and a plus 1350MHz offset on the memory. The core clock it was consistent around the 810MHz mark, and I set the fan speed to a constant 65%. And for information, the heatsink and fan were clear of any surface dust before this test was run. This resulted in hash rates of between 39 and 40 mega hash per second over a 24 hour period, and the card drew about 62 watts. The average temperature during this test on the GPU was 62 degrees, the hotspot came in around 68, and the memory clocked in at an average of 84 degrees C. Now, the RTX A2000 uses a mixture of Torx T6 and T8 screws rather than Phillips, but it's not a complicated card to take apart, and yes, the heatsink is being held on by only two screws. With it stripped down and the fan unplugged, you can see how much Nvidia has actually crammed into it, which is really commendable. That's the same GPU that you find in the full fat RTX 3060, and six 1GB GDDR6 memory chips are tightly packed around it. The 12GB version of the same card has the same layout but uses 2GB chips instead. The heatsink itself, well it's not exactly what you would call heavy, but it is a solid machined piece of aluminium, which has been coated. Now the reason for this is simply to prevent oxidation over time, which would act as an insulator, so you're maybe sacrificing a tiny bit of cooling potential here up front, but you're getting consistency over a much longer time span in return, and that's especially good if the card has been used in harsh or humid environments. Now it's mainly the thermal pads we're thinking about today though, and like all cards using an Nvidia reference design, these pads, well, they're about as bargain basement as you could possibly get. Now Nvidia doesn't supply the data sheets for these, but it's safe to say they're simply not as good as even the most budget aftermarket pads. Now I bought this Thermal Grizzly Minus Pad 8 from Amazon for under a tenner, and it was delivered the next day. And it's safe to say that it doesn't cost Thermal Grizzly anywhere near that to make, and when you're thinking about economies of scale, it's not unreasonable to suggest that Nvidia would be saving at most a few dollars per card by using the pads that they do in their cards instead of something higher quality like this. So let's replace the pads, pop on some Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut, and see if it makes a difference. The whole process literally took 15 minutes, and with the card reassembled, I set it up for another 24 hour stint on ETH and recorded the data over time. Using the exact same settings as before, and under the same test conditions, the difference was pretty startling, especially considering this card is only a few months old. Memory temperatures in the mid 70s, almost a double digit drop, and a small but tangible drop on the GPU and hotspot temperatures. 
Now for reference, under this test I previously would not have seen less than 77 degrees C on the memory, with the fan running at 90% speed, so overall it's a fantastic improvement, and highlighting that as neat a package as the A2000 is, there's still a lot of room for improvement to the thermal transfer characteristics of this cooling setup. So I can honestly say that doing this, if you've got a reference style Nvidia card, or in particular an RTX A series workstation card, it's well worth it. The reason I've done it is going to become apparent soon with a neat little mini ITX gaming build which is going to be using the A2000, but regardless of what your use case for this card is, gaming, work or mining, get those pads sorted out. I think we'll wrap this one up on that note though, were you surprised by the results? Are any of you running an Ampere card and had to do the same, and if so what pads did you end up using? Be sure to let me know. For now though, thank you very much for watching, take care, and I'll see you all in the comments section down below, and in the next video.